My, my interests are in young onset uh, uh, degenerations, young onset disorders. Uh, uh, frontotemporal dementia is the prototypic young onset disorder. Uh, but Alzheimer's disease is almost as frequent as frontotemporal dementia in, 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 as a young onset disorder. And by young onset, we usually mean before age 65. Um, I won't specifically be talking about disorders today, the, these particular disorders today, other than, uh, other than the fact that the young onset dementias are more frequently associated with behavioral changes. And I will be talking specifically about behavioral changes today. So I'll be spending a bit of time talking about why FTD is interesting in that context. Um, I gave a version of this talk about two years ago. Um, it's been embellished a little bit, so I apologize to anybody here that was here two years ago um, for the repetitiveness. Um, I, I'm going to start the, the talk, though, by saying, uh, by defining the word dementia. I, I know this is a question, uh, hopefully I'm preempting this question. It's a question that always comes up whenever we, we talk about anything uh, related to uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and, and associated disorders. You know, what's the difference between a dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Well, the dementia actually comes from the Latin, it, it's a, it, it means without the mind. It's not specific to any particular disease. Uh, it's a syndrome where people lose their cognitive abilities um, in a person who didn't have cognitive impairment before. So somebody who's lived a normal life and who develops cognitive difficulties. That's beyond what we would expect for normal aging. And the, the difficulties are severe enough to cause uh, a loss of functional independence. So if somebody's working, they can't work anymore. If they used to live independently, they used to manage their finances or their medications, they can't do that anymore. Then we talk about a dementia. What's important is that a dementia is not a diagnosis in itself, it's just a description of the severity of the disease uh, and is obviously caused by something else, an underlying disorder, and there could be many of these uh, by far the most common uh, disorder uh, is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, dementia is very, very common. Uh, about uh, 30 to 40 million people suffer from dementia worldwide, and uh, almost 6 million people suffer from it in the U.S. alone. So it's not an unusual phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that all of us have been touched with, and I'm sure if you're sitting here in this room uh, that it's touched you. Um, the, the prevalence of, of dementia and of Alzheimer's disease in particular increases dramatically as we get older. Um, below uh, the age of 65, it's uncommon. Um, about 10, up to 10% of people below the age of 65 can have a dementia. That doubles every five years. So 10% at 65, 20% at 70, 40% at 75, and so on. So that at the age of 85, up to one in up to 50 percent, one in two people are going to suffer from a, a dementia of some sort. So it's that common. Um, as I mentioned, there are many, many causes. Alzheimer's disease being the most frequent, and a lot of the behavioral changes that we'll be talking about will will be in will are seen in Alzheimer's disease. But there are a lot of other causes, including vascular dementia. Lewy body dementia, uh, a disorder that's frequently associated with dramatic behavioral changes. Frontotemporal dementia, the prototypic young onset dementia, also um, associated with behavioral changes. And finally, many, many others. I like to, um, this is a graph that I use frequently to sort of put things in perspective. Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common. And then we have vascular dementia at the far left, uh, which is probably not as frequent as we thought it was mixed disorders where Alzheimer's and vascular disease are, are found together uh, probably form a, a large number of, of uh, a large proportion of pe patients who suffer from dementia. Lewy body disease, uh, which is a, a, a disorder that looks a little bit like Parkinson's disease, is associated with hallucinations and, and episodes of confusion. It um, is, uh, I wrote 7% here, but it's probably much more than that. In fact, here in Nevada, I, I think I see about three or four times more uh, Lewy body disease than I saw uh, in, on, in Eastern Canada. Maybe there's something in the water. I, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't have a good explanation, but it's a very pertinent question. Why? 
Um, and uh, Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease actually frequently coexist. They're often found together. Uh, I wrote down 5% here, but I actually think it's much more than that as well. And then there's uh, all these other dementias, frontotemporal, Critchfeldt jacob disease, the so-called mad cow disease or mad cow variant. And then a couple of disorders, corticobasal degeneration, supranuclear policy. I saw somebody this morning with, with one of these unusual disorders. Now, I, the way I like to think about, about dementias in general is that it, it's a little bit like inf an infectious disease. The, the disease starts somewhere by the deposition of abnormal proteins in some part of the brain. And which disease we're talking about will depend on what exactly is depositing in the brain. So, for instance, in um, Alzheimer's disease, there's deposition of plaques and tangles, amyloid and tau. You may have heard these terms before or seen pictures of these things uh, um, uh, in papers or in journals. Um, frontotemporal dementia is due to the deposition of, uh, of a protein called tau or another protein called TDP43. Um, and, and they form what we call PIC bodies. And the frontotemporal dementia is sometimes called PICS disease. So these are two examples, um, and uh, Critchfeldt jacob disease or prion disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, Lewy body disease, these are all associated with abnormal proteins depositing initially in some part of the brain. And then, and this is the neurodegenerative part, these bodies, these abnormal proteins that are accumulate, they propagate. They, go, they move from cell to cell and they start causing damage in a pattern, in a, in a way that invades the brain very slowly over years. The pattern, the way in which the brain gets involved uh, varies from disease to disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the one that we understand the best. Uh, the initial changes in the brain occur in the temporal lobes and you can see those here, the, the little blue specks that you're seeing on the picture is where the, the early changes of Alzheimer's disease start. And as the disease progresses, more and more parts of the brain become involved. So you can imagine seeing the sequences, progression of, of changes in the brain that the symptoms of the disease will be of a per certain kind initially when, the f when the, only the parts in the temporal lobes are involved. And as the disease progresses, more and more parts of the brain become involved and newer and newer symptoms will appear what symptoms appear depend on which brain regions we're talking about. And here you can see mapped on these pictures of the brain, the various um, symptoms or, or functions of, of that part of the brain that could be involved. Um, so the temporal lobes where, memory, where uh, Alzheimer's disease begins is basically responsible for memory. And that's why Alzheimer's disease is a disorder of memory. If you note here uh, on the, the frontal lobes, I don't know, is the, is the pointer going to show? Can you see the pointer? So here, uh, emotional control is part of the frontal lobes. And frontotemporal dementia, which affects the frontal lobes initially, causes emotional, loss of emotional control. Um, well, in the case of frontotemporal dementia, the main symptoms is kind of a detachment, a lack of caring. Um, uh, la oh, lack of empathy. No, no. In the case, where, well, your frontal lobes are very important to generate um, to generate feelings for others. And so, if you don't have your frontal lobes to decide how you're going to deal with uh, somebody crying or somebody being hurt, uh, then you're 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 not going to feel the right things. I don't know if that makes sense. I was instructed by Susan very early on, and I apologize, to ask to restrict questions for the end of the, uh, although I much prefer the, your, your approach, um, uh, if you don't mind keeping your questions for after uh, the end of the talk. Um, now, when we think about dementias as a whole, we think, well, you know, there's, the person becomes dependent, they, they, they're unable to manage their finances, they're unable to manage their medications, they can't cook anymore, they can't dress anymore, and, and it, this is true. Th these are the things that we do see with, with Alzheimer's disease and the dementias. This is a graph that shows how these things are lost as time progresses and uh, as a function of one of the tests that we do, the, the Fullstein Mini Mental Status Examination, which runs from 30 perfect score to zero. This is a small test that we do almost every day in clinic. And as you can see, when you're, when you're scoring very high on this test, uh, you, you're able to do things like keep your appointments, use the telephone, but as, as the disease progresses and as more parts of the brain become involved, you lose 
many of these functions that are considered critical for day-to-day -day for day-to-day -day living. Uh, and in the very late stages, people are not able to do simple things like walking or feeding themselves. Now, I point that out just to, to give you a sense of how things progress. But what's really interesting is before all of this, there are actually a lot of changes going on, including the behavioral changes. Behavioral changes um, uh, are actually probably begin before any of the functional impairment that we see. So shifting a little bit now, shifting to focus more on the behavioral changes, almost every patient with a dementia syndrome will suffer from some form of behavioral change. Some of them will occur very, very early in the disease, and some will occur very late in the disease. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, behavioral changes could be the very first signs that something is happening, that there is a process take, that's just getting hold and is uh, beginning to, to rear its ugly head. Um, these are the parts of the brain that are actually most involved in uh, behavior and emotional processing. I, I moved a couple of slides. Uh, all of the slides are identical to the ones that you have, but I, I'm, I changed the sequence of one or two of them. I apologize. Um, but as you can see, the, the important parts are the, the frontal part of the brain, uh, the, the tip of the temporal lobe, over here, and another area called the insula cortex here, which is buried deep inside the brain. These are areas that control our emotional behavior. Um, turns out that these are the parts that are affected in frontotemporal dementia. But they're also affected in Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and Lewy body disease. Um, this is a slide I borrowed from <coughs> one of my mentors in Montreal, Serge Gauthier. Um, I have not been able to find a, an, an English translation um, but uh, I, I, like it, I like it a lot because it also allows us to see that there's not a whole lot of difference in the scientific and medical speak uh, when it comes to the description of, um, of the changes in, in Alzheimer's disease. But as you can see, uh, as time goes on, these are some of the things that we see in, in uh, dementing processes. Um, humor means uh, humor or mood, uh, cognitive changes, functional changes, Comportment is behavior, so whether the person is able to uh, follow commands or, or uh, behave properly when we ask them to do something. And then motricité is uh, motor function. So as you can see, uh, some early changes in mood uh, will disappear as the disease progresses. And later on, these will be replaced with more difficulties with behavior. So something to think about when, when you're dealing with some of the changes is that not every, it's, these are moving targets. Um, this is a, a nice study that was done by uh, Barry Grossberg um, where he was able to show, looking at retrospectively at charts from patients, that many of uh, the patients in fact develop social withdrawal, depression, even suicidal ideation as much as three years before somebody could make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Three years. So the impact of behavioral changes is very important. Um, uh, it causes significant suffering, particularly when there's depression. Significant suffering to both the patient and the caregiver. Um, it, uh, it causes considerable burden on the caregiver and also an economic burden because often um, the patient can't do things or needs to have things done for them. Um, this occurs in, it occurs more frequently in the context of functional decline that's a little bit quicker than we expected. Um, and uh, it, behavioral problems often lead to uh, premature, premature institu institutionalization. Obviously, when somebody has behavioral problems, we, often, we worry about their safety as well. I like to divide behavior into sort of four global uh, groups, if you will. Uh, the first being mood, and we'll talk about that a little bit more than the others. Another one is agitation. Sleep, believe it or not, is a behavior. Uh, and when, be when behavioral abnormalities affect sleep, uh, that can be very difficult. And finally, uh, another form of behavior that's very difficult to, uh, to manage called psychosis. Um, we'll talk about that specifically as well. So moving on to mood. Um, mood can be divided into a number of uh, di well, there are different types of mood. Um, this is a picture I grabbed from the internet a couple of days ago. It was actually from a, a peri... Um, 
perimenstrual cycle uh, website. Um, and I, I use it because it, it, it's true. It, uh, not that women have perimenstrual cycle changes in mood, but, but that the, the things that we attribute uh, to, to you and me every day are felt by, by patients who suffer from dementia. And these are apathy, depression, anxiety, and euphoria. So apathy. Uh, apathy is actually, you know, we often confuse apathy and depression. Apathy occurs, is probably the most frequent uh, mood disturbance that we see in, in dementias. Um, and it occurs across the entire spectrum. So although on the graph that I showed you, mood, mood changes are, are early on and they have this, they, they get worse and they go away and then the behavioral changes occur later and they get worse and they go away. Apathy can be throughout. Uh, apathy is kind of an indifference, not really caring about what's happening, not really being motivated, not specifically being depressed or, or feeling sad or melancholic, but just, I don't care, it doesn't matter. And that can be very hard, especially when you're invested and your loved one is not. Um, it, it actually, it, it's found across the spectrum, but it does get worse as, uh, as the dementia progresses. And it's very frequent in, in frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body disease, but it does happen in vascular and uh, Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, apathy is a lack of interest, less affection, no, less involvement in personal relationships, loss of enthusiasm, less in, initiative, and social withdrawal from that. Depression, on the other hand, one of my supervisors when I was younger, uh, when I was training for behavioral neurology, said, kept saying, you know, it takes a really good brain to be depressed, because uh, you need insight. You need to understand what's happening to you to be depressed. So it's not surprising that depression, when it occurs, occurs early in the disease, and then not so much in the later stages. Um, so it's worse in the early stages and, and less present in the severe stages. Um, being depressed can contribute to physical aggression, uh, and it often coexists with anxiety. Euphoria is a little bit more, uh, a little bit less frequent. Um, it's uh, one of the more uh, frontotemporal dementia is more frequently associated with euphoria. Euphoria is like a, a sense of I can conquer the world, everything is beautiful, um, and uh, a lack of awareness of what's really going on. And that can be difficult because the patient thinks that they can get away with anything, that they can drive, that they can manage their medications, that they can live on their own, and they, they can't. Uh, so it, it takes a, a little bit of deflation to deal with that, and that can be difficult, both for the caregiver and for the, the treating physician. Uh, agitation, uh, the last of, uh, uh, sorry, the agitation, uh, I've just moved on from mood to the second of the four forms of behavioral changes. Agitation is, a, is a, a, a probably the most significant um, problem that we that I think any caregiver has to deal with. Um, uh, it's uh, as I said, it's a common behavioral change. The, the second most common behavioral change after apathy. It's seen in the more moderate and severe stages, um, and it can take a couple of different forms. Um, one of the ways that uh, scientists have divided it is is to, to think about it as verbal agitation or nonverbal agitation, and aggressive agitation or non-aggressive agitation. And here are some examples of uh, verbally aggressive agitation, things like swearing and making threats, uh, verbal non-aggressive, being repetitive, saying the same things over and over again, um, occasionally pleas for help when there's not a clear problem that you can pinpoint. Physical aggression is more difficult, hitting, biting, scratching, kicking, um, pushing. Uh, these occur more in the context of uh, when something needs to be done uh, and uh, the patient is not co cooperating. Uh, so frequently these are, these are forms of oppositional behavior. So uh, having a shower, going to the doctors, uh, getting dressed, getting ready for uh, the visit to uh, other family members. Uh, physically non-aggressive behaviors are not as bad, you can sort of let them, let them go, um, but for instance pacing and wandering can be problematic. Uh, somebody who's having difficulties walking who absolutely wants to pace that can be a problem um, because of falls. And wandering, of course, a problem because um, if you wander away from the home, you can get lost. 
Um, aggressive behavior can occur in 20 to 50 percent of patients. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's generally correlated with severity, but also with involvement of the frontal lobes. And um, we were talking about the frontal lobes and, and uh, sort of processing, you know, how we should be behaving. Um, there are a number of other factors that affect aggression, including when you're unable to complete activities of daily living. So if, you, if somebody needs to intervene to help you with your activities of daily living, you, you, you can become more aggressive. If you're depressed, you can become more aggressive. If you're constipated, you can become more aggressive. Um, and uh, it's more frequent with uh, severe impairment. I write constipation here, it'll come back a little bit later, but it's often something that we overlook and something that can be a trigger for many of the behaviors that we see. Um, wandering, uh, a big problem, uh, specifically uh, when you can't keep somebody from walking into traffic, you can get beaten up by uh, highway patrol uh, police officers. <laughs> Um, or you can, you can end up in traffic and get hurt, <laughs> sorry. Um, I want to talk a little bit about particular behaviors that we see in frontotemporal dementia. Uh, disinhibition, uh, which occurs from frontal lobe damage, uh, socially inappropriate behaviors, being impolite. Um, excessive or abnormal eating is something that we also see in FTD. In fact, it's al almost diagnostic of frontotemporal dementia, uh, eating more than before. Uh, and all of the other dementias lead to a reduced uh, appetite. And then com funny compulsive rituals. Just for the sake of, um, Could you? of uh, a demonstration, uh, I will... Uh, this is a, a gentleman who suffers from a young onset dementia. This is a published case in um, a, a electronic textbook that's available to neurologists called MedLink or neurobase at the time. Um, and so it's a, actually published, it's not one of my patients. I say that as a caveat. Uh, so listen, watch and listen to this 54-year-old uh, chemistry professor. Could you say the months of the year, but say them in backwards order, start with December, oh, and December, go back to yeah. January. Yeah, 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 d d d d December, November, December, November, October, September, August, July, June, <laughs> July, June, May, April, May, April, April, February, January. <laughs> so he, um, he has euphoria. I don't know if you appreciated that. He's very happy, go lucky, life couldn't be any better. Um, he has uh, stereotypies, this sort of tendency to do repeated movements. So this is a form of non non-aggressive non, uh, um, uh, non uh, behavior, non-aggressive physical behavior changes. Um, and he's doing a task that we frequently ask patients to do to recite the months of the year backwards. I don't know if you noticed, it took him about 20 seconds to do that, maybe 25 seconds. People with, uh, you and I should be able to do that in about 12 or 15 seconds. So he has trouble focusing um, and, and uh, this is all due to frontal lobe damage. Um, other forms of agitation, uh, sexually inappropriate behavior. Again, something that's very difficult to deal with. Uh, this occurs in people who can do it. Uh, so people who are young, um, in men, in people who don't have comorbidities, people who don't have uh, other things that might prevent them from expressing uh, sexual desires or um, behaviors. And, and also people who are generally in, in better physical condition. Uh, we see it in all the dementias as well, but more often in, in young onset dementias because there are fewer comorbidities, fewer, less sickness, um, less general sickness. This is a term that, that uh, I think is in the literature a lot. It's seen uh, on, on websites, uh, sundowning syndrome. Um, it's a, a phenomenon where, where somebody who has cognitive impairment or an early dementia functions pretty well at the beginning of the day, but as the day progresses, they become less and less able to, to manage things day, within their day, and they might, uh, they might become either confused or agitated uh, as the day progresses, and uh, in this particular uh, rendition turns into a monster. 
Um, sundowning um, is defined as the increase or appearance of agitation, confusion, or other behavioral changes in the late afternoon or evenings. Uh, it's not a diagnosis in itself, it's just a, it's just a phenomena that we see in, in patients with any form of dementia. There are multiple factors that can influence sundowning, and I'm talking about this in, in, in a way to, to discuss what we can do about it, um, but uh, it, the most important factor in sundowning is a disruption of the circadian rhythm, this sort of sleep -wake, natural sleep-wake cycle that we all have. So frequently when somebody experiences sundowning, <laughs> the first question to ask is, well, what's going on at night? Are they actually sleeping well or not? And are they busy during the day? So let's talk about sleep disturbance, which is the third of the four forms of behavioral changes that uh, we're going to talk about. Um, sleep disturbance can take many forms. Uh, probably the most frequent form, the one that affects all of us, is uh, occasionally insomnia. Uh, when insomnia is present, I think we need to think about depression and potentially treating that. Um, again, depression <coughs> and insomnia uh, are things that occur very early in the course of an illness. Um, poor sleep leads to increased daytime somnolence. So it's one of the characteristics, one of the things that we'll, that we'll ask about is, the pay, is, the, is your loved one falling asleep during the day? If so, then what's going on at night? Is there a sleep disturbance? Um, it's the consequence of uh, altered circadian rhythm. The Alzheimer's disease in particular actually affects a, par a part of the brain which, which regulates the sleep-wake cycle, so it's not unusual for, for a, 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 a flipping or of a tendency to be asleep during the day and awake during the night. And it is something that we try to address very early in the disorder. Um, another form of sleep disorder that we, that we see, uh, particularly in Lewy body disease, is a form of, uh, of a sleep disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder. REM sleep is, that is, stands for rapid, um, rapid eye movements. Uh, so it's that part of the sleep where you're, where you're dreaming. Uh, your brain, uh, when, you're, when you're dreaming, if, if you were to live, if you were to um, actually do the things that you're experiencing when you're dreaming, uh, you could be running or fighting or cooking or, um, or playing chess, and, and you can imagine that it wouldn't be a good idea to be doing that in bed. So the body has a way of preventing you from performing all those actions while you're dreaming by paralyzing itself. Um, there's a mechanism that allows for paralysis of all the muscles below the neck when you're in REM sleep. What happens in REM sleep behavior disorder is this, this paralysis, this mechanism to paralyze your body uh, malfunctions and the paralysis doesn't take place. So the person experiencing the dream suddenly starts acting out the dreams. And so you'll see somebody who's maybe having a nightmare <coughs> about being uh, being pursued or, or being or falling or uh, fighting and they'll actually run or fight. Uh, so you'll have them going like this during their sleep. Actually, let me show you. So imagine being this person's bed partner. He's still asleep. So I know that's not, not what you had imagined, but that, that is what occurs. That is what occurs. And patients can fall out of bed. Uh, they can hurt themselves. They can hurt their bed partner. This is seen in, in um, Lewy body disease, either Parkinson's disease or, or the frank Lewy body dementia. As I mentioned, some, some, sometimes uh, this can be a, a very, very, very early sign of a disorder. It can occur up to 15 or 20 years before uh, the disorder actually manifests otherwise. This is a gentleman who's not demented. I, mean, I could comment on his pick choice of clothes, but um, <laughs> he's not demented. In fact, he's found a way to prevent himself from falling out of bed. He created this sort of strap around his waist and a, and a cord that attaches to his bedpost. Uh, to prevent him from falling out of bed when he goes through these. Um, finally, the last type of uh, behavioral change that, we, that, that I want to talk about is the so-called psychotic changes. These are, fr uh, can be frightening. Um, they're more frequent in moderate and severe disease, uh, and they're a consequence of uh, sort of losing touch with reality. 
um, you can lose touch with reality in a couple of ways. Your senses, your primary senses, your vision or your, your hearing, uh, or even your, your, your tactile senses can play tricks on you. Uh, so if your vision plays tricks on you or is detached from reality, you'll suffer from hallucinations. If your idea, if your impression of what's happening to you day to day, of your relationships with others, loses touch with reality, then you'll suffer from delusions. Delusions are the belief that maybe somebody is stealing from you or that your spouse is cheating on you. Delusions are very common in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they're often very mild initially, and we don't have to worry about them too much other than sort of redirecting the, the suspiciousness that's present. Hallucinations are, are common in Alzheimer's disease, but in the very later stages. They're very common in the early stages of Lewy body disease. Um, I think I just said this. Yeah. And the hallucinations, as I mentioned, are, are very, very frequent in, in, uh, in Lewy body disease. The, in fact, um, let me tell you about, uh, this is a, a paper that was written by a friend of mine, uh, Jim Salas. Uh, he was a, a, co a resident with me when I in Montreal. Um, he uh, did a, a short biography of Marvin Peake who is a, uh, a playwright and a, a, an artist who lived in England uh, at the turn of the last century. Um, this is a self-portrait of him, and these are in the, uh, on the left and on the right is a, a picture, another picture that he drew. Um, it's believed by some, including my friend Jim, and I agree, uh, that, he, uh, that he suffered from Lewy body disease. Um, these are pictures of some of his hallucinations. Um, and the, this on the left is another self-portrait. Another characteristics of Louis, characteristic of Lewy body dementia is that the patients fluctuate up and down. They have very good moments and very bad moments. And when they have good moments, they realize that they're going to have a bad moment. Um, and that realization, that 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 uh, maintained um, uh, uh, autocritic, maintained um, insight, uh, is. Uh, allows them to sort of feel fright f to fear when they're going to go back into this uh, this state where they're they're not as fun functioning as highly so in in this picture he drew himself with a dunce cap sort of expressing how he felt about himself uh, this is a another hallucination drawn by a, a patient with Lewy body disease a very very uh, an elephant under a chair very very colorful so very well-formed, very unusual um, hallucinations. Um, typically, the patients with Lewy body disease will describe animals, people, children, uh, hanging out outside or, or often asking their, their caregiver, um, why don't you invite them in and have them sit down? Uh, they're not always frightened by the, uh, the, the, these hallucinations, which is why we don't always treat them. Um, but if they do, get, if they do frighten them, um, we sometimes have to intervene with medications. Uh, they're not always pleasant, though. This is another uh, hallucination drawn by somebody who suffered from Lewy body disease. Um, so th that was kind of an overview of, of the changes, the behavioral changes that we can experience. I didn't, I didn't specifically, as, as, apart from FTD and Lewy body disease, where these are most frequent, I didn't specifically associate any one behavior with any one disorder. I'd like to, um, to shift gears for the last few slides and talk about predictors, what, what's going to predict whether uh, diseases can occur, whether these behavioral changes can occur, and what we can do about them. Um, I, I guess I talked about each of the disease, uh, about diseases and, and the fact that they can be associated with, uh, with behavioral changes, but there are often um, if you think about a, a, a dementing disorder or a disorder where the brain is being damaged slowly, uh, the, the brain is much more fragile when it's in this process. And so other milder insults like an infection, <coughs> constipation, uh, medications uh, can have a, a much bigger impact on the person's ability to do things day to day and on behavior than somebody who doesn't have the brain disease. So it's very important when, when these things occur that we ask, well, is there something else going on? Was there a change in medications? Is there an infection? And to try and, and reverse that or, or correct that process. Uh, so we always, uh, we always explore medications. 
uh, whether there's any change in medical condition, uh, whether there are environmental factors like the sundowning, or whether there are other psychological factors that could be triggering uh, the, the behavioral changes. The big culprits in terms of medications are Xanax, Ativan, the benz so-called benzodiazepines, the, the Valium-like medications. Um, a lot of our patients arrive uh, in our offices on these medications because they've suffered from anxiety. And we've, um, the first, one of the first things we do is we try to get rid of them. Narcotics, so uh, 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 morphine and all of its analogs, uh, oxycodone, Percocet, um, these are medications that can uh, easily produce uh, these behavioral changes. Uh, anticholinergics. Uh, there, there, anticholinergics is a term that we use to describe a, a, a certain class of, uh, many classes of medications. Um, Alzheimer's disease, you may, you, you may know the, the main treatment for Alzheimer's disease is Aricept or um, Donepezil and the other two, Galantamine and uh, the patch, Exelon. These are all medications that increase cholinergic function, that increase the concentrations of acetylcholine in the brain. Anticholinergics, medications called anticholinergics, do the reverse. So they actually, they, they do the reverse of what we're trying to do to help patients. Um, there are many kinds of medications that have anticholinergic properties that interfere with cholinergic function. Uh, certain antidepressants, particularly the tricyclic, so medications like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, dizipramine, these are, um, uh, and Paxil, in fact, is another medication that has significant anticholinergic effects. A lot of anti-nausea medications, many sleeping pills, Benadryl in particular, uh, which is an over-the-counter sleeping pill, uh, is an anticholinergic. And many medications that are used to treat incontinence have significant anticholinergic properties. And these are all things that people elderly, that people, that older people will suffer from and that are likely to cause an exacerbation of behavioral problems. So we have to clean up. Medical conditions that can, that can lead to uh, changes in behavior, depression, constipation, uh, the delirium, they didn't speak very much about delirium, I'll say, have a few, I'll say a few words on it uh, in a few minutes. Simple dehydration, something that we have to worry about a lot here in Las Vegas. Uh, pain that's not being addressed, um, urinary tract infections, all very, not necessarily easily diagnosed, but it's very easy to ask the question and to sort of look, are, are we dealing with one of these things and can we help? I talked about environmental factors, too much noise, not enough noise, uh, being overstimulated, or having a sleep disturbance. These are all things in the environment that can cause uh, confusion and behavioral changes. Psychological factors, being lonely, being left alone at home and not really having uh, a goal or, or a plan, uh, being bored, uh, physical inactivity, um, and things that we ourselves do to our loved ones, for instance, uh, losing our patients, uh, showing disrespect, um, or asking them to do things that they just can't do. All things that we can adjust ourselves. Um, I don't have a specific site on delirium, but delirium is uh, a, a, an actual medical condition which is caused by either too many drugs, an infection, um, another medical condition such as a heart attack or pneumonia. Uh, it's, it's when there's a, a, a more dramatic change in a person's thinking or cognition and often associated with behavioral changes. When things happen suddenly, um, we, uh, we worry a lot more and we often ask uh, patients to be brought to an emergency room where they can be evaluated for delirium. Um, so when, when um, what, what do we do? Uh, what do we try to do for people who suffer from behavioral changes? Well, the first thing is to know that they're there. Uh, frequently, if there's a behavioral change, the family will bring it up, uh, and so we're, we're aware of it. But if it's not broached spontaneously, we, we need to ask, and it's often it's part of the usual questions that we'll ask you day to day when, when we see you in clinic. Um, so screening and assessment remain important. Um, Part of dealing with the, the, the problem is trying to identify exactly what it is that's taking place. You know, uh, he's behaving badly. Well, what do you mean? You know, what, what is the context in which this happens? Is it when you're trying to dress him or when it's time to go to the bathroom? 
or um, you know, trying, trying to clarify exactly in detail the circumstances that lead to the bad behavior. And that's not often something that you think about but when, you, when you come to the clinic and you say, I've got this problem. Uh, and then when we start exploring the problem, it's more difficult. So one of the things that, that you can do to, to try and, and help with that is to, to think about what it is that, that occurred and what did I do before and th did I do anything that helped it a little bit or did I do something that made it worse. Um, and this description is very important because it can lead to changes in behavior, in our own behavior, that will avoid the need to use medications. Um, how do we manage? Um, well, first thing, we have to make sure that people are safe. So if wandering is taking place we, and then there's a highway nearby, we, we want to make sure that that's not happening. And it might involve having somebody present 24 hours a day or locking the doors or um, getting uh, some sort of, of uh, alert system that alerts someone if the patient leaves the, the facilities. And that's what memory care centers do. Um, we will order uh, additional investigations as indicated. As I mentioned, when we suspect that a delirium, an infection, constipation, something else is going on, we'll order other tests. Uh, don't always have to see the patient in order to decide that we need to order these tests. We can order them over the phone and, and have uh, the patient go to a, a Quest or LabCorp to, to get these tests done. Sometimes we ask the family doctor to, um, to, to do these routine tests. As I mentioned, uh, non-pharmacological interventions, although there's not as much written about these as all, as all the medications that we can use, uh, I think they're, you know, we the physicians need to be uh, uh, pushing these as much as we can. Um, and they, they start with sort of recognizing what triggers are there and learning how to prevent the problem. Uh, making sure that our, our loved one is not uh, sitting at home alone, not doing anything and, and, and is very bored intervening when, uh, how do we intervene when, when a process begins, when a behavioral problem starts? Um, the textbooks tell us never to say this, but, but I've, I still find it very helpful. Uh, sometimes a lot of the behavioral problems can't be dealt with by reasoning. Uh, they have to be dealt with by diffusing or deflecting the situation. Um, so uh, think about how you deal with a toddler, for instance, who says, no, mommy, I don't want to do that, uh, when it has to happen. Um, you, you, you find a way around the problem. You uh, distract or change the topic and then come back to it without necessarily addressing it directly. Uh, so a little white lie that's allowed. Um, there are uh, courses that are available for caregivers as well in how to, how to sort of adapt these, uh, adopt these, these um, behavioral changes. And there's some research in uh, things like PET and aromatherapy, uh, using music, bringing back uh, the topic of conversation to things that uh, our loved one knows about, things that they've experienced with you uh, in the past, uh, so reminiscence. Uh, and then uh, depending on how much insight there is, validating what's going on, saying, yes, you're right. You know, this shouldn't have happened. Yes, you're right, I, I ignored you or I disrespect you or, um, and, and, and having a, a more reasoned discussion. But that's more difficult as the disease is, uh, progresses. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's hard to know what to do in, in any one circumstance. I think everybody's very different and, and we need to tailor these non-pharmacological interventions to uh, the, the the, the patient himself, uh, him or herself, and the, the caregiver uh, in the environment. Um, occupational therapists are actually very helpful at that, and I'm very happy that we'll soon have our own occupational therapists here on site to help. Uh, pharmacological interventions are, are um, I'm not going to say a last resort, but the, uh, the, the point is, is that there, there are no um, uh, FDA approved medications for the treatment of behavioral problems in dementia, none. Uh, so everything that we do, every medication that we give in an effort to, to treat some of these changes, we do off-label you know, with, uh, with all the warnings that, that we can. The first principle is first do no harm, primam non, non cere. The principles, uh, these are my, my principles, my, my first approach is to try to improve thinking. Uh, so, so find a way to make the mind work better rather than shutting it down. Uh, if a depression is present, then treat that. Um, 
if there's a sleep disorder, try to fix that too. So in terms of, of helping uh, the patient think better, uh, cognitive enhancers that help cognition, these are the routine medications that we use to treat Alzheimer's disease, those are the most helpful, the cholinesterase inhibitors, those medications that increase cholinergic function, uh, donepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine, and also memantine, uh, which acts on the glutamate receptor, um, works with the cholinesterase inhibitors. So many patients who, who suffer from Alzheimer's disease and, and a re, or a related disorder are on both of these forms of medications, memantine and the cholinesterase inhibitors. So as I mentioned, first try to make the patient think um, and function better, and that should reduce some of the behavioral changes. Help with mood, antidepressants, uh, are actually very helpful, uh, and which antidepressant to use it depends a lot on the context, on whether there's anxiety, whether there's anger, whether there's a sleep problem or not. Um, but there are, uh, we have an armamentarium, the, the number of antidepressants available to us is a staggering number, but um, my colleagues and myself tend to choose from maybe four or five different ones uh, that, we, that we have a lot of experience with. And I find after having helped the thinking, helping the mood uh, is effective. Um, in terms of helping the sleep, I think there are a, a number of alternatives available depending on the situation. Uh, if there's a disruption in the sleep-wake cycle, often it's a question of keeping things busy during the day in a day center or with activities with friends or doing things that keep you awake and engaged so that when the night comes along, you're sleepy and you deserve your good night's sleep. Um, uh, we, al we also use medications to try and help with sleep. I, I tend to use antidepressants with sedating properties uh, that help with sleep. And sometimes we use, uh, um, depending on the situation, but people with REM sleep behavior disorder actually respond very well to one particular medication uh, called uh, clonazepam. Um, unless, light, unless, unless there's a life-threatening behavior, um, as I mentioned, treat cognition, mood, and sleep first. But then uh, if that doesn't work and, and you, you, the behavioral difficulties really impair function day to day, uh, we'll move on to tranquilizers, so-called tranquilizers. I try to stay away from those. And when we start them, we start them knowing or, or hoping that this is only for a short time, that we're going to stop these in... Um, a month or in three months or in six months. Um, and the principle in starting any medication is to start low and go slow. Um, this is a problem if the behavioral difficulties are, are, are particularly salient and, and a big problem that we start on a small dose and then we just say, well, that didn't work. Well, we increase the dose again. If, if, if the behavior is, is life-threatening, then we tend to start with larger doses, although we try to avoid that. There's a new medication that, that uh, was part of a clinical trial that we ran here last year. The, the clinical trial ended a few months ago. Uh, the results of the clinical trial are not out, but my impression, and I'll be faulted for saying this, but my impression is that the medication is very helpful for some of the behavioral changes that we talked about. Um, the medication is called Nudexta. Um, it's actually available off-label for, for treatment. I've, I've used it in a few patients and been very successful. So there, there are other forms of medications other than the major tranquilizers that are becoming available. And in fact, if Nudexta, uh, if this trial that was just completed is positive, Nudexta might be the very first medication approved for the treatment of behavioral problems in, in dementia. Um, special considerations, as I said, the REM sleep behavior disorder in Lewy body disease tends to respond exquisitely to the medication clonazepam, and that's the only context in which I would use that medication. And as I mentioned, um, we, we try to avoid neuroleptics or tranquilizers at all, uh, as much as we can, but in Lewy body disease, uh, one of the characteristics of the disease is that these patients are very sensitive to neuroleptics, uh, and at all costs we try to avoid them, although sometimes we, we can't. Um, on my last slide, uh, prevention and early intervention is key. Uh, there's discussion about all of the things that I've talked about in, in any of the websites, uh, the, the Alzheimer's Association website, the Alzheimer's Association website, the FTD Association website, and, and the, um, uh, the Alzheimer's website from the NIH is also very good. And there's our library. And I didn't write it there, but our social workers, uh, they're great. 
That's it. I'm on time, although I did start late, so. <laughs> so I can take questions. Yes. Yeah, Tylenol PM contains um, medications like Benadryl uh, that are typically anticholinergic. So, yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's, uh, I guess, an important point. Uh, we, you know, we ask what medications are you taking. Tylenol PM is an over-the-counter medication. It's not always, you know, you don't always think of, about t telling us that you're using it. Uh, there are much better alternatives. Um, I think Tylenol PM should be avoided in anybody over 65, even, even the rest of us. Um, it, it depends on the context, but uh, I use trazodone a lot, uh, so low dose trazodone uh, at night only for sleep. Maybe tryptophan is the first Yes, and melatonin as well. Yeah. People talk about melatonin. Um, you know, those are not prescribed medications. The but conference is about to end. <laughs> okay. Does, does Elko have any questions? Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the spectators here uses a program called Luminosity for cognitive uh, stimulation. Functions at the yep. I think exercise, I mean, I, I, I didn't mention the word exercise once in my talk, and, and uh, shame on me. Um, because uh, if, I don't know, I saw a few of care caregivers that I know here, and, and you, all, you will know that I insist on exercise. It's probably the most useful thing that you can do for yourselves and for your loved one is exercise every day. It's part of that doing things during the day that activate your brain and your muscles and your body and that allow you to get a better sleep at night. Um, it's also shown that uh, exercise is probably more effective at preventing the deterioration that we see in Alzheimer's. Not preventing it completely, it won't make it go away, but it'll make it happen slower um, and it, it'll, have it, it'll allow it to have less of an impact on your day-to-day -day function if you exercise. And by exercise, we mean 30 minutes every day of aerobic workout. And that means hot, sweaty, and out of breath. Not because it's hot outside. <laughs> Uh, Next. Regarding the circadian rhythm, would you say that uh, Alzheimer's patients, if possible, could avoid long trips through multiple time zones? I think the th those kinds of situations are difficult, um, but sometimes you you know you don't want to. Uh, prevent them from experiencing things that, that have been part of their life every day. If you have family on both shores of the U.S., you, 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 you don't want to take that away. So there's no, uh, it, the patients with Alzheimer's disease will suffer from the change in time zone uh, more than you or I will, but uh, I, I would, yeah, it depends on whether as a group, as a family, you're, you're able to manage that. So trying to get a regular schedule as soon as you get into the, the new time zone is uh, recommended. I think melatonin would have a very good application here. And, I, and, and sleep medications like Ativan, uh, though we don't use Temazepam, Ativan, uh, Lorazepam, you know, all the medications that we use that are typically thought of as sleeping pills are appropriate in the short term uh, for people with uh, sleep difficulties because of a change in time zone. <laughs> that has nothing to do with behavior. Uh, I, you know, we don't. There's been a, a there's a lot of a lot of press on coconut oil right now. It's um, it's very exciting, uh, and uh, and I'm I'm I, I look forward to seeing the research come out. But I have not seen anything yet that is double-blind, placebo-controlled trials showing either stabilization or improvement or prolongation of, of general function using these medications or prevention using. Um, so these are all like anecdotal Yeah, yeah. But it can't hurt. It can't hurt unless it can hurt your wallet. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not saying don't take it. Uh, everybody's. You know, there was a, a very large trial of a medication called Dimabon a, a, a little while ago. It's an antihistamine. It was run in the uh, in. It was run by a very good 
uh, clinical trialist from Texas uh, who, who ran the trial in, um, in Eastern Bloc countries. Not, not, not while it was still a wall, but uh, uh, since. So it was run in Russia and Romania and uh, I think uh, Hungary. Um, but anyway, the, the results were, were uh, incredibly positive. Everybody thought, oh my God, you know, the, 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 this new medication is going to transform the treatment um, landscape for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, the FDA requires two studies. So another study was run here in the U.S., completely failed. In fact, uh, there were worse side effects. So uh, it's not clear. You know, there, there's a data out there, but until you accumulate enough to, to, to really prove, uh, you know, beyond a doubt that the medications that we're using are helpful. I agree. There hasn't been anything negative, but the negative things don't tend to get published. So if, if I'm a maker of coconut oil and I have five studies and two of them were great and three of them were not so great, I'm going to tell you about the two positive ones. There's a, a risk for, you know, people, there's a risk for taking advantage of people who want a solution or who want a treatment. Um, I'd say if, if, you, if, if you use it or if you give it to somebody and you, 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 you have a sense that it's working uh, and it's not breaking your, your, your budget, then go ahead. I don't think that there are any dangers. Is that fair? Yes. Is that fair? Uh, I think you're right on. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucier. One question more, and we'll let you go back okay. to the clinic. Once a person enters most of the uh, stage seven uh, mm -hmm. uh, symptoms of stage seven Alzheimer's, how important do you think it is to continue with the Namenda and the Exelon patch? Yeah. The, the question was uh, when you're in the, in the later stages of the disease where the person is, and you use the word seven, uh, the number seven, that's uh, the uh, staging where we go from one, which is you and me, to, to seven, which is bed bound, being, being fed. So six uh, and seven. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a lot of debate about that. Um, there's a belief that Namenda in particular can still be helpful in some of the, the um, behavioral problems uh, and sort of, you know, if you have to have somebody sit down or stand up or go to the bathroom, you still need to work with them. Um, and some of the, the interactions are better with, with these medications. Uh, but it, it, I think it's different in every person. Um, one experiment that was, or one of the ways that somebody tried to look into this is that often patients are, are when patients end up in uh, memory care centers, all the medications are stopped. Uh, and then, for some reason, a lot of problems arise. Uh, and that's some data along those lines have been used to suggest that these medications are helpful in the longer term. It's been more difficult to show that starting the medications in those stages is helpful, though. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr.